Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, welcome back to class. Uh, before we begin um, looking at our course content this morning, can anyone lead us in prayer, please? Father, we want to thank you for this morning. Lord, we submit us as a class to your mighty presence. Lord, we pray even as we go about learning your word. We pray, O oh God, that you would continue to speak to us. Enable us to listen from your word and understand the mysteries of your word, Lord Jesus. What you have intended while writing the scriptures. So we pray, O oh God, that help us to understand that in the same spirit. And we submit Pastor Selena to your hands and ask for your wisdom, your grace to be upon her, Lord Jesus. We bless this day, Lord, in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Thank you, John. Uh, were you able to go through your uh, notes, what we did uh, last class? Can anyone uh, tell us what we went through last class or what we learned last class? Anyone could do a quick, short recap or just present one or two points what we went through last week or last class. What is the doctrine we were studying? Remember that at least? We're studying about the first... word of God. Okay, we were studying about the doctrine of the word of God. Okay. We started learning about the canon, uh, the, uh, how, uh, you know, how the books were aligned, Old Testament canon. Okay. Thank you, John. Yes. So we're looking at, uh, we were looking at the first doctrine, that is the doctrine of the word of God. And um, we were looking at uh, canon of scripture, the can canonization of scripture. Uh, and we saw that the terms canon or canonical uh, signify standards by which books were measured to determine whether or not they were inspired or uh, whether or not they should be in the Bible. So we looked at some specific tests uh, that were considered for the canonicity of the books of the Old Testament. And, um, and I mentioned to you those were not in your notes, and I hope you uh, wrote it down. So we looked at um, uh, seven uh, tests, specific tests that were considered for the canonicity of the books of the Old Testament. The first one was that the books indicate divine authorship. Second one, did it reflect God speaking through a mediator? Third, was the human author a spokesman of God? Fourth, was he a prophet or did he, you know, have the prophetic gift? Uh, the fifth one was, was the book historically accurate? The sixth one, did it reflect um, a record of the actual facts or the actual events that took place at that moment, at that time in history, uh, and how was the book received by the Jews. So we looked at uh, the specific tests that were considered for the canonicity of the books of the Old Testament. Uh, and we also said that, you know, there were a lot of other writings that were, uh, you know, written during um, uh, the Old Testament time and during the intertestamental period, but they were not considered as uh, inspired books and hence they are not part of the Bible. And these are called as apocryphal writings. So there were many apoc apoc uh, apocryphal writings that existed, uh, but since they were not considered as inspired, they were not included in the Bible. Now, what are apocryphal writings? Now, the word apocrypha means hidden or secret. So the apocrypha are the religious writings that were neither considered as authoritative uh, nor canonical. Now, the writings of the apocrypha should not be regarded as part of the scripture, 
uh, for these following reasons or uh, the the writings that were written uh, other than what we see in the in the old testament uh, you know why weren't they considered as uh, books to be in the bible um, now these were some of the reasons they do not claim for themselves the same kind of authority as the old testament uh, uh, writings and we know that um, you know what was the authority that these old testament writings were actually inspired word of god or there where the word of god was because the people around them uh, around the prophets the scribes the teachers uh, the priests uh, the leaders they considered them as you know people who were appointed by god uh, people who spoke the very words of god or people who who uh, through whom god uh, spoke and gave commandments or laws or what the people had to uh, do okay so they were uh, not regarded as god's word by the jewish people from whom they were uh, they originated they were not considered to be scripture by jesus himself uh, so he did not quote them when he spoke uh, and uh, neither were they these uh, writings quoted by the new testament uh, writers the writers of the new testament books uh, you know they don't quote uh, any of these writings or sayings from these apocryphal writings okay and they do not contain teachings that were consistent with uh, the rest of the bible and since uh, these were the reasons uh, hence you know these apocryphal writings were not considered as inspired and hence not considered in the canon and uh, they are not part of the bible okay now we'll move on to the new testament uh, canon uh, now how did the books of the new testament come into formation um so the new testament canon begins with the writing of the apostles um uh, we read in uh, john chapter 14 was 26 and um, uh, john chapter 16 was 13 and 14 so can somebody read uh sorry it's not here Okay, can somebody read uh, John chapter 14, verse 26, please? And somebody else can read from your Bibles, John chapter 16, verse 13 and 14. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I said to you. Thank you. And um, uh, chapter 16 of the same book of John, verses 13 to 14. Can somebody else read that, please? Uh, can I read? Yes, sure. Uh, John chapter 16 verse 13 but when he the spirit of truth comes he will guide you into all the truth for he will not speak on his own initiative but whatever he hears he will speak and he will disclose to you what is to come he will glorify me for he will take of mine and will disclose it to you okay thank you john so here we see that um uh, you know, uh, Jesus is saying that uh, uh, when he goes back to the Father, the Father will send the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit will teach the disciples, the apostles, um, you know, uh, those who believed in him. Uh, he, he will, uh, the Holy Spirit will teach them all things. He will also remind everything that Jesus has spoken and said to them. And he also mentions, Jesus also mentions in John chapter 16, that when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide them into all truth. So here we see that Jesus is promising the Holy Spirit's empowering to his disciples to recall accurately the words and the deeds of Jesus. Um, and also he's promising them that when the Holy Spirit comes, the Holy Spirit will guide them into all truth. Okay, so we see that it was the Holy Spirit who inspired the writing uh, writers of the uh, New Testament to write exactly, to recall everything that Jesus had spoken, had said uh, exactly as he had 
uh, done. Okay. Now, uh, those who are apostles in the early church um, are seen to also claim authority equal to the Old Testament prophets. And, uh, and what is the authority that they were claiming an authority to write and speak the words that were the very words of uh, God. Okay. Now we read in, um, in uh, Second Peter uh, chapter uh, three verse two. So can somebody read Second Peter chapter three verse two, please? Second Peter chapter three verse two. It says that you may be mindful of the word which were spoken before by the Holy Spirit prophets and of the commandments of us and the apostles of the Lord and Savior. Okay. So here it's saying that, you know, he's, uh, Peter is encouraging his readers to remember the commandments um, which the Lord had given, which they received through the apostles. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 37, uh, Paul is telling uh, the Corinthians that he's writing to them the command of the Lord. That means the very commands that the Lord has given him, he's writing uh, uh, to them. And in 2 Peter chapter 3, verses uh, 15 to 16, you know, Peter is testifying that Paul's writings uh, clar and he uh, testifying of Paul's writings and he's clarifying them as scripture. So can somebody read uh, 2 Peter chapter 3 verses 15 to 16, please? It says, and Consider that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, has written to you. 16. As also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to understand, which untaught and unstable people who twist to their own destruction, as they do also the rest of the scriptures. Thank you, Lubega. So here in Second Peter chapter three, uh, verse fifteen and sixteen, Peter is showing, uh, you know, uh, clearly not only an awareness of the existence of written epistles uh, from Paul but also clearly, uh, you know, is classifying all of Paul's epistles with the other scriptures. Now, uh, in the end of uh, this verse, in, in, uh, uh, in verse 16, we say, it says, as they do the other scriptures. Now, this word uh, scriptures here, uh, you know, um, when translated in in the in the Greek, you know, uh, it means and it refers to the Old Testament scripture. Now, this word scripture here uh, in Second Peter chapter three verse sixteen, scriptures uh, is uh, occurs fifty. 51 times in the New Testament, and at all times it refers to the Old Testament uh, scriptures. In every one of its occurrence, 51 times, it's referring to the Old Testament scripture. So, this word scripture here uh, that uh, Peter is writing uh, in uh, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 16, he's saying that this word scripture was used not only for writings that were thought to be God's word, you know, but it was, and hence it was considered to be part of the canon of scripture. So this word, this word scripture used here uh, was used only of those writings that were thought to be God's word okay consistent with the rest of scripture that is consistent with the rest of the old testament and hence it is part of the canon of scripture okay so in this verse you know peter's classifying classifying paul's writing with other scriptures meaning the other old testament scriptures and hence paul's uh, writings are considered by peter to be worthy of the title scripture and thus worthy to be included in the canon. And hence we see that all of Paul's letters uh, are in the New Testament. 
Okay, in First Timothy chapter 5, verses 17 and 18, can somebody read that please? First Timothy chapter 5, verses 17 and 18. First Timothy chapter 5, verse 17 and 18. The elders who rule well are to be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who work hard at preaching and teaching. For the scripture says, you shall not muscle the ox while he is threshing, and okay. the laborer is worthy of his wages. Okay, here in First um, Timothy, Paul is writing uh, this letter to Timothy, and Paul is saying that the elders who rule well should be counted worthy of double honor. And in verse 18, he backs it up with scripture. Uh, can you please uh, mute your mic? Thank you. Okay, so in verse 18, he backs it up with scripture, uh, scripture and he says, uh, for scripture says, do not muscle an ox while it's treading out the grain and the worker is worth his wages or deserves his wages. So we see that in the first part of verse 18, you know, Paul is quoting from Deuteronomy chapter 25 verse 4. But the second part, you know, Paul is quoting from Luke chapter 10 verse 7. So Paul is quoting a portion of Luke's gospel and by quoting it, he's, you know, he's uh, accepting it as scripture, he's calling it as scripture, even though Luke was not an apostle. And so here we see that, you know, there were some writings that were considered to be inspired because they were uh, written by apostles, but there were certain apostles who also wrote, but their books were considered to be inspired and hence part of the canon, hence part of the uh, the New Testament. Uh, why? Because of the other apostles who considered their writing as uh, uh, scripture, uh, as inspired by God, and hence, uh, you know, those who are not apostles, their books were also considered to be uh, uh, a part of the canon, part of the New Testament. Now, how did the church recognize which books in the New Testament were canonical? Uh, so there were certain tests applied to answer, uh, you know, the question which books were inspired or which books uh, were canonical. The first one is apostolicity. Uh, so was the author an apostle? Okay. Uh, did he have a, any connection with any apostle? For example, Mark wrote under Peter's authority and Luke wrote under Paul's authority. And we see that the book of Jude was accepted because of the author's association with uh, uh, James, okay? So even though some of them were not apostles like uh, Jude, like um, Mark, um, and like root, we uh, like Luke. Sorry, you know, um, we see it was these books were accepted in the in the New Testament because of their, um, uh, you know, they wrote under uh, Peter's authority or they wrote under Paul's authority and under James's authority, and hence uh, they were considered uh, to be in the uh, New Testament. The second um, uh, test, okay sorry, that was uh, uh, used was, uh, you know, was this book accepted? Okay, was the book accepted by the church at large? Um, was the recognition given to a particular book by the church was important? So by this, the canon uh, false books were also uh, rejected. Okay, so if these books were considered um, uh, as accepted by the church at large, then it was, uh, you know, a part of the uh, New Testament. But if they were not accepted, they were rejected, then, you know, they were not part of the uh, New Testament. The third test was the content. Now, did this uh, uh, writings um, or did these books reflect a consistency in the doctrine um, which was already accepted as uh, traditional, uh, was accepted as approved um, and established teaching according to what is in the Old Testament? Uh, so where these books 
folks uh, consistent with the doctrine. If they were consistent with the doctrine, then they were accepted. If they were not in line and if they were not consistent with the rest of um, uh, the biblical doctrines, then they were not considered in the canon or they were not considered in the uh, as New Testament books. The fourth thing was inspiration. Now, did this book reflect the quality of inspiration? That means whether inspired by God, inspired by the Holy Spirit, uh, did the book uh, uh, reveal a high evidence of um, moral and uh, spiritual values? And uh, did it reflect uh, uh, the inspiration or the work um, of the Holy Spirit? And if uh, it passed the test, then, you know, it was considered in the uh, New Testament. So these are the four tests that were used uh, to um, test whether the books that were written during the intertestamental period time, during the New Testament period time, if, you know, uh, they were to be part of the books of the New Testament in the Bible. So the first one was were they apostles or did they have any connection or did they write under the authority of the apostles? Uh, was it accepted by the church at large? Uh, you know, um, the third thing was the content. Was it uh, uh, in line with the rest of um, uh, the doctrines? Uh, was it accepted as the traditional approved established teaching uh, with the rest of scripture? And the fourth one was, is, was it inspired? Uh, you know, uh, did it reflect high moral spiritual values and did it reflect the work of the Holy um, Spirit? Okay. Before we move on to uh, the characteristics of scripture, do you have any questions about uh, the canon? Or the canonization of scripture? Or the apocryphal writings? No, uh, there are no questions and we'll move on to the characteristics of scripture. What are some of the characteristics of scripture? First of all, the, char what the first characteristic is it is authoritative. That means uh, all scripture, every word that is there in God's word in scripture uh, is, uh, you know, uh, is uh, spoken by God. Uh, so it's under his authority, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And, um, uh, you know, uh, any of us, if we disbelieve or disobey any word of scripture, uh, it means we are disbelieving or disobeying uh, God. Okay, so the first thing is that it is authoritative. The second is it is inherent. Inherent means that it is just free from all error. So the inherency of scripture means a scripture in the original, original manuscripts uh, uh, do not affirm anything that is contrary to fact. Uh, they were uh, considered uh, to be facts because of the, uh, the cultural, the historical settings, um, the facts that were mentioned were all accurate and also was um, what they received uh, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, uh, uh, Spirit or, uh, you know, what they heard from God and what God had asked them to write. So hence, we see that scripture is inherent. That means it's free from all error, free from all mistakes. Uh, the third thing is um, that um, it is scripture is Clear. The third characteristic of scripture that it's clear. The clarity of scripture means that the Bible is written in such a way that, you know, uh, uh, we'll be able to understand its teaching, uh, understand its revelation uh, when we seek God's help, when we ask him to reveal deeper truths, when we ask the Holy Spirit's help and ask the Holy Spirit uh, to uh, to teach us to reveal uh, the deeper truths, the uh, the uh, the hidden revelations, and um, you know when we are willing not to just uh, receive those revelations, when we are um, uh, willing not to just read it and acquire knowledge, but when we are uh, willing to follow it, you know. Uh, scripture becomes uh, more clear, there is more clarity, uh, because um, we are not just receiving the truths um, uh, and uh, understanding it as the Holy Spirit interprets it to us, but we're also taking the next step of our willingness to follow it. So um, 
the uh, the next um, characteristic of uh, scripture the fourth one is that it is necessary okay what is the meaning of the necessity of scripture it means that bible is necessary uh, for us to know uh, the gospel the truth uh, uh, to know the nature of god to know um, uh, uh, how he works um, uh, to understand the gospel and for also for us to maintain a spiritual life uh, to walk in god's word to grow and mature in our faith to be transformed into christ likeness and also to know god's uh, will at every point every stage and every step that we take in life so uh, the next characteristic of scripture is that it is necessary necessary for our godliness necessary for our growth necessary for uh, us to understand god his nature uh, the way that he uh, acts uh, what he does and also for us to know god's will okay the last characteristic of scripture is that it is sufficient uh, sufficiency of scripture means that scripture contains all the words of god that he intended to reveal at different points or at different stages in the redemptive um, history of mankind um, and so we see that god revealing different things at different stages uh, of uh, uh, or at each stage of the redemptive history of mankind and the word of god now contains you know everything that god wanted to um, uh, reveal or that he purposed in his mind to reveal to us uh, everything that we need for salvation everything that we need to uh, for for us to know him to trust him uh, and for us to know his will and for us to perfectly obey him so you know scripture is uh, sufficient and we do not need anything more uh, we do not need any more revelations uh, from god whatever he wanted to reveal is already there but of course we need uh, uh, the holy spirit's help to reveal to us what those revelations mean the deeper truths of what god has already revealed to us okay so this is the end of um, uh, chapter 2 uh, the doctrine of the word of god anyone has any questions uh, any comments to make anything that you like to say anything you all didn't understand you want me to teach again or explain no questions nothing you all want to say i hope you are able to understand Pastor, yes, you are straight to the point. Continue. Sorry, Lubega. I'm saying that you are straight to the point, and you are you are straight and sound. Thank you. Okay. Let's continue. Okay. Thank you. Okay. We'll then continue uh, and move on to the third chapter, the doctrine of God. Okay. Now, what do you think we'll be studying in the doctrine of God? what do you think we'll be studying in this chapter doctrine of god existence nature okay god. the existence of god uh, the nature of god thank you john anyone else Yeah, so we'll be basically looking at uh, the existence of God and his nature. Uh, so first we look at uh, how do we know that God exists? Okay, how do you know that God exists? Come on, uh, it's not a, a difficult question. Can we have some class participation, please? How do we know that God exists, or how do you know that God exists? I think. Oh, yes, go ahead, Lubega, and then we'll go on to uh, Rosalind. I think when we look at so many other things in on Earth that uh, have, are being created by 
by humans, like artistic pieces, it actually shows that also the earth did not just come from nowhere. It explains that the earth must have a spiritual being. Okay. Thank you, Lubega. So you're saying when you look at what man creates, uh, everything from uh, spacecrafts to uh, engines to machines to things that they invent, uh, so the knowledge of man, you're saying that uh, it's not from their, you know, from their own wisdom or their understanding or knowledge. It has to be from somebody that is uh, eternal, uh, somebody who is a superior being, somebody who is more powerful, somebody who is uh, all wise, right? That is what you're saying, Lubega? Okay, we'll move on to Rosalind. Yes, Rosalind. Ma'am, when I see the creation around me, so I believe there is a creator. Okay. So when God, we... Yeah. yeah, thank you, Rosalind. When we look at creation, uh, there's harmony, there's order, there's perfection, uh, there's no chaos. Um, everything just works in perfect order. We know that it just did not come about with the Big Bang. <laughs> uh, it does not just happen on its own, but there is somebody who is uh, a, a wise God, uh, a, a creator uh, who sustains everything, who holds everything, who you know has brought everything into perfection and um, order. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? How do you know that God exists? Nobody mentioned about scripture, the word of God, right? When we read uh, scripture, uh, we see uh, God's nature, we see his attributes, we see what he's done. Uh, it, it shows us or tells us there is a God and who he is, right? Okay, so even scripture uh, uh, tells us uh, uh, the existence of God. And also we have our own uh, conscience, okay? Uh, so, uh, the first thing is humanity's inner sense of God, okay? All persons everywhere have a deep inner sense that God exists and, um, uh, and that we are his creatures and that he is their uh, creator. Um, I remember when I was studying theology, uh, my teacher uh, told us this, you know, they were having a debate, uh, uh, you know, with, uh, uh, you know, uh, one group, uh, an atheist and the others who believed in the existence of God. And um, uh, uh, it's sad, but who won the discussion was the atheist. And when the, uh, when the, the atheists won, one of them said, uh, you know, thank God we won. Okay, so uh, I just still, I still remember that. So even though they try to prove there is no God or uh, you know God does not exist, uh, but you know deep down there is a, 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 you know their conscience or their inner sense that there is a God. You know there is some there is a, a thing at least a superior being, um, and everybody is uh, 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 you know uh, in that. Uh, uh, pursuit of looking for who the superior being or you know trying to find the superior being in their own understanding and uh, worshiping that superior uh, being and we also see Paul writing about this in Romans chapter 1 verses 19 to 21 so can somebody read that it's on your screen please Romans chapter 1 verses 19 to 21 Because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful but became futile in their thoughts and their foolish hearts were darkened. Yeah. So here we see that, uh, you know, um, uh, Paul is saying that, you know, uh, what is known 
or manifested about God is known to people because it is seen in the creation of the world. God has manifested himself uh, or shown himself through his uh, creation. And through his creation, uh, you know, uh, mankind is able to see the invisible attributes of God. Uh, though uh, the attributes of God are invisible, but it can be clearly seen. It can be clearly understood. Uh, you know, uh, and even his eternal power uh, of God, uh, uh, God can be seen. And the Godhead, the, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit can be seen clearly. Okay, and hence men or women are without any excuse that, you know, they uh, nobody shared the gospel with them or they did not know about Jesus. But, you know, Paul is saying that, uh, telling the Gentiles that, you know, Gentiles are the unbelievers that, uh, you know, they can, cannot make this excuse because God has manifested himself or made himself known. His invisible attributes can be clearly seen, can be clearly understood. His Godhead, uh, his eternal power can be clearly seen and understood when people look at uh, creation. And hence, uh, they are without any uh, Excuse, And it was uh, 21, Paul is saying that, you know, the un unbelievers knew God, but even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or gave or give him uh, thanks. Okay, so they did not uh, honor him as God, they did not give him uh, thanks. And so we see that sin uh, causes people, if you read Romans chapter 1 verse 18, uh, Paul is saying there, you know, the verses, uh, uh, the verse proceeding to Romans chapter 1 verses 19 to 21, uh, we see that sin causes people to deny their knowledge of God uh, and also by their wickedness they suppress their truth. So Paul is saying that, you know, even though God has made himself manifest, okay, uh, 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 through his creation, uh, and people are without any excuse. But in verse 18, he says that it's sin that causes people to deny their knowledge of God. And also by their wickedness, they suppress their uh, truth. Okay. So the first thing is, uh, you know, our inner sense or our inner conscience that holds us accountable uh, that, you know, there is a God. And um, uh, the second thing is believing the evidence in scripture and uh, nature okay so we see that when we look at the bible uh, we know and we have the evidence that uh, uh, god exists uh, and we see this throughout the bible and uh, also bible assumes that god um, exists so if you're convinced that the bible is truth uh, or it's uh, you know it's the truth of god uh, then we know that the bible not only that god exists but we also know about his nature and his uh, deeds or his acts, what he has uh, done. Okay. Now we also look at our, the creation. We look at the world, and the world, uh, God's uh, and God's creation gives us abundant evidence uh, of the existence of uh, God. Romans chapter one, verse twenty. Can somebody read that, please? It's on your screen. Romans chapter 1, verse 20. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Yes, so here we see that, uh, you know, uh, that creation declares... Uh, you know, uh, the invisible attributes of God, it declares his eternal nature and uh, uh, the divinity of God is clearly seen in the things that God has um, made. Also, Psalms chapter nine, 19 verse 1. Can somebody read that? Psalms 19 verses 1. The heaven declares the glory of God and the firmament shows his handiworks. Yes, he says that the heavens are witness to the glory of God. That the glory of uh, uh, glory of God means who God is and what He uh, does. Okay, so all of creation, 
you know, the sun, the moon, the stars, sky, clouds, are continually declaring by their existence, by their beauty, by their greatness, uh, that there is a powerful and there's a wise creator that has made them. And uh, the same creator sustains them in their order. Okay. Uh, the next thing that we can look at are the traditional proofs for the existence of God. Okay, there are some traditional proofs that are there, um, uh, which we can study, which people have uh, studied, philosophers have studied, and um, uh, uh, they're trying to prove whether God exists. The first one is the cosmological uh, uh, argument, cosmos, universe. Uh, so in this cosmolo uh, cosmological argument, uh, uh, they say that, you know, every known thing in the universe has a cause. And therefore, the universe itself must also have a cause. And the cause of such a great universe can only be God. Okay, so they're trying to say that, uh, understand, or uh, prove the existence of God by saying that, you know, Everything that we know, uh, everything that is there in the universe has a cause, okay? And therefore, universe itself must also have a cause why it was brought into being or into existence. And that cause uh, uh, is, you know, can only be God. So that is the cosmological argument. The next one is the theological argument, okay? Uh, the theological arguments uh, is the evidence of harmony, order, and design in the universe. So they are looking at, uh, uh, you know, uh, creation being in such perfect um, order, harmony, and design. And since there's uh, such a perfect order and harmony, um, you know, it gives evidence to an intelligent purpose. Okay. Somebody who is... Uh, you know, uh, brought this about, purposed this to happen, and somebody who's done it in perfect wisdom and intelligence. And since the universe appears to be designed with a purpose, uh, you know, uh, there must be an intelligent and purposeful God who created it to function this way. Okay, so this is what is the teleological argument that since there's perfection, design, order, and harmony, uh, and a purpose why this whole uh, creation was brought about, hence there must be a, a purposeful God uh, who is intelligent, all wise, who created it to function in such a harmonious and a perfect way. Okay, the next argument is the moral argument. Okay, and moral we know is, uh, you know, what morality is right and wrong. Okay, since man has a sense of what is right and wrong, uh, and also they, uh, man, you know, looks for justice to be done when they face injustice. Hence, there must be a God who is a source of the sense of what is right and wrong. Okay, so he's saying that uh, those who are, holding on to this moral argument or uh, bringing about this moral argument is saying that, you know, uh, since mankind uh, has a sense of knowing what is right and wrong and they're looking for justice, it cannot be brought about on their own. There must be a God who is a source, who is, you know, giving them or giving mankind uh, this, uh, this whole moral attribute of uh, what is right and what is um, wrong. Okay, so this is a teleological argument. And so we looked at uh, the existence of God. Uh, we saw it, you know, through our inner sense. We looked at Romans um, uh, chapter uh, one, and then we looked at um, uh, uh, God's existence, which is evident in his scripture. And also uh, nature proves the existence of God. And we looked at some of the traditional proofs that were held on traditionally by people, people uh, and how they proved uh, the existence of God. Any doubts?
Okay, if there are no doubts, we'll move on. Uh, so we're looking basically at the doctrine of uh, God. And so we looked at the first one is, uh, you know, in the doctrine of God, we study whether he exists or not, the existence of God. And then we will all uh, are going to also be looking at uh, the nature of God. Now, when you think about the nature of God, what comes to your mind? When we think about the nature of God, what comes to your mind? His character, he's being powerful, he being sovereign. Okay, thank you. We, uh, when we talk about the nature of God, we uh, talk about the characteristics of God. Anything else? Thank you, John. Only his characteristics? Yeah, his compassion, his love for mankind. Okay, so we can say that as his uh, qualities, his attributes. Okay, so the nature of God is basically his uh, characteristics, his attributes and his uh, qualities. And we're basically talking about who God is and what he does. Okay, so God's nature is revealed both in his attributes and in his names. Okay, that is why we see throughout scripture, uh, God, uh, there are different names of God um, uh, that represent who he is, reveals who he is, reveals his nature. Uh, also, the covenantal names of God um, that reveal um, the, his covenant relationship with uh, mankind. Okay, so we see that God's nature is revealed both in his attributes and in his names. Okay, and all of creation uh, reveals who God is and speaks of his greatness. We read about this in Romans chapter 1, verse 20, and Psalms chapter 19, verse 1. Can somebody read that, please? Romans 1, 20, and Psalm 91, it's, uh, 19, 1, it's on your screen. Can somebody Can who's I not read? read? Uh, yeah, go ahead. Please. Yeah. Romans 120. For since the creation of the world, his, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by things that are made, even his eternal power <clears throat> and good head is so that are uh, without excuse. Yeah, we already read the scripture passage and we, we saw that, you know, uh, creation reveals the invisible attributes, the nature, the eternal power and the Godhead uh, uh, is seen in and through creation. Psalms 19.1, uh, we also see that, you know, it reveals, uh, uh, creation reveals the glory of God. Uh, we already read that scripture. The word of God reveals the nature of God to us. We already saw uh, that in, uh, you know, some of the scriptures that we read um, and uh, you know we see that Jesus Christ the Logos the word who became flesh um, uh, revealed uh, or is the perfect expression the perfect representation of God and hence he revealed truly who God is to us you know Jesus when he became man he was the perfect expression he was a perfect representation of God and um, God's picture of who God is, his nature and what he does is revealed in the person and the work of uh, Jesus Christ. We read that in John chapter 1 verses 1 and John chapter 1 verse 14. Uh, we've already read this uh, scripture passages a couple of times in the last few classes. Uh, we also see this in, uh, read about this in Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3. So can somebody re quickly read Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3 please? Hebrews chapter 1 verses 3, who, the, who being the brightness of his glory and the express of his image of his image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power. And he had by himself purged our sins, 
sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high uh, thank you uh, so we see that here you know uh, jesus is the uh, express image of his person that means he's a perfect uh, expression the perfect representation of the nature of god or who god is uh, before we end this class uh, we'll just look at an important point in the nature of god uh you know god's nature and his works always are inconsistent with uh you know sorry god's word and his works are always consistent with his nature okay so whatever we read in scripture and whatever we see about god's word and uh, and what he has done his works it is always consistent with his nature that means it's always consistent with who he is, who he is what he has said and what he uh, does god will never say uh, something or do something that contradicts who he is okay so an important test for us to evaluate if something is truly from god is to see if it aligns with god's nature and how do we know that we can always go back to scripture because scripture uh, you know uh, is always in uh, consistent with uh, god's uh, nature scriptures revealing things that are in consistency with the nature of uh god okay before we close you know bill johnson uh pastor bill johnson said whatever you think uh you know about god which you do not find in the person of jesus christ you have to a reason to question whatever you think you know about god which you do not find in the person of jesus christ you have reason to question okay so if you want to know more about god then you look at the person and the work of jesus christ what he has taught what he has done and if it is consistent with his nature of what he has done and what he has said then you know uh, you know that's the truth about who god is and if it is not in consistency with who jesus is and what he has done then you have a reason to question pastor bill johnson also said that jesus christ is perfect theology that means what jesus said what he did how he lived he revealed god the father exactly uh, to us with no contradictions and hence he says jesus christ is perfect theology so if you have any questions about who god is his nature his doing his working his will then look at scripture and also uh, look at um, uh, jesus christ uh, his person and his work okay we'll end with that any questions sorry i've taken 2 minutes uh, extra time any questions if not uh, we'll end class okay thank you everyone have a good day and i'll see you on friday bye